For those of you who were here last August when Ray came to address us, um, you, know what, you know what a treat you're in for, and the rest of you will find out. Um, uh, Dr. Ray Raymond uh, is a former British diplomat. Uh, he uh, was 20 years in the British service. Um, the British Foreign Office does that w interesting thing that our State Department never did, uh, which was to find a few people who were really, really good in particular parts of the world that were important to Britain, in particular Russia and the United States, and put them in places like St. Petersburg and New York and leave them there for a long period of time, and they know everybody, and Ray knows everybody. He had the exalted title of political officer, which doesn't tell you anything, except that in our world it probably implied he worked for MI5 or MI6, which he doesn't, or didn't, not that I know of. Um, but he has an affinity for some 007 guy, so. Um, the, um, retired from the uh, British Foreign Office, uh, British Foreign Service and Her Majesty's Service in 2005, and since then has been teaching at the State University of New York, special assistant to the Chancellor, uh, and doing a lot of consulting and writing He's working on a PBS documentary um, about some British officer by the name of Benedict Arnold. You may have heard of him. Um, uh, and uh, just a lot of other things that uh, Ray is doing. He's out here ostensibly. I mean, he's here courtesy of the Air Force Academy because Ray and I also serve on the New York Selection Committee for the Marshall Scholarships. Uh, Ray is the chair of that, and so he comes out. Uh, we try to bring him out uh, every year, if, or if not every year, every other year. Uh, to speak to cadets who were trying to compete for Rhodes and Marshall scholarships, and I get a free lecture in my classes, um, and it just works really well. Um, let me see, a lot of other things about Ray. Um, in 2000, he was honored by Her Majesty the Queen as a member of the Order of the British Empire, which, if you know anything about the British awards, is, it ain't too shabby. Um, very in honor of his very distinguished service uh, in, the, in the service of Her Majesty's government. Um, he also has a long affiliation with some school on the Hudson um, that the Air Force cadets can tell you about, um, and the social, in the social sciences department there, and he was a special lecturer, the Thomas Hawkins Johnson lecture uh, professor um, in 2009 as a distinguished visiting professor there, but he has a long association there as well. He has a great um, uh, affection and knowledge about this country. I think Ray, and as I introduced him earlier today uh, to my cadets, I don't know of any single person who has more knowledge, insight, and understanding about this country, this society, and this country's role in the world than Ray. Um, He's English, educated at the University of Dublin, uh, PhD from the University of Kansas in contemporary American history, where amongst other things, he married a lovely lady from Kansas, um, and uh, did a postdoc Humphrey Fellowship at Yale. Um, so he has a, a lot of experience. He's got the most wonderful library you'd ever want to have. Um, and if you ask him a question about the Beatles, I warn you, he knows everything about the Beatles. Uh, could probably sing all the songs and give you all the significance of all the lyrics, the jacket covers and the records and so on, so be warned about asking any Beatles questions. Um, also the owner of a first edition set of James Bond. Uh, yeah, so it's, it, this is a man of, uh, of, of great taste. Um, Ray hates to provoke. <laughs> he hates to speak his mind. Um, and I dare say by the end of the evening, you still won't know what his political inclinations are, although I hasten to add he is a British subject, and therefore he just gets to watch American politics with amusement. Um, and uh, without further ado, Dr. Ray Raymond. Sky, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, far too generous, far, far too generous um, indeed, including, by the way, this monstrous blurb about me on your website, quote, renowned scholar and commentator in America's role in the world. Gracious me, gracious me. I can only say, Sky, seriously, I can only say to you that you deserve to go to heaven for your generosity, wait for it, 
and to the other place for your exaggeration. <laughs> I hasten to add that a much more accurate description of my um, nefarious past can be found on the FBI's most wanted list. <laughs> you know, since the Navy SEALs took down bin Laden, I've moved up the list. Easier to find, yep. easier, easier to find. There we go. Now, long ago, I learned that with a British accent and a beetle haircut, yeah, I do have a beetle haircut, unrepentantly, um, you get away with almost anything in America. <laughs> so tonight, I'm going to test that proposition to the fullest. I speak to you tonight, all joking aside, as a Briton who loves this country. I love America. And I've seen one great English-speaking power go down in this world, and I do not want to see another one going down. I speak to you as an honorary American. I speak to you also as a child of the Pax Americana. I'm a very happy child of the Pax Americana. It has created for us a new and international order which has provided a situation where we've had no great power conflict, we've had more people, more prosperous than ever before, more democracies than ever before, and a United States military that has guaranteed freedom of the seas, freedom of the air, and American power behind it, supporting this liberal international order. This matters. This really matters. And I have to agree with Bob Kagan, this is where I sometimes come out on the conservative side of the house and sometimes not, that if we lose this, if there's not strong enough American power behind it, don't think that this lovely benign international environment is going to keep staying out there, it's going to keep existing out there. It's not. It's not. We need the United States as a great global power. That for me is an unquestionable answer. And it's therefore against that background that I have to share with you why I'm worried, very, very worried. To put it simply, the world depends upon the United States, but American global power is only as strong as its economic health at home. And that economic health at home, to use the American vernacular, ain't good. It's in fact worse than you think it is. What really frightens me, I suppose, is that I have seen absolute decline. As a boy growing up in Britain, the late 1960s, 1970s, I saw what absolute decline looks like, and it's not a pretty picture. A crumbling infrastructure, right? A declining economy, businesses that can't get started. And I'm afraid I see many of those symptoms in the United States today, and why it leads me to suggest this is why I want to be provocative tonight, and I say this with no joy. I'm afraid that America may, and I stress may, I hope I'm wrong, may be in the first stage, not of relative decline, that's inevitable, but of absolute decline. And I do not want to see that happen. Because the kind of decline that becomes so painfully obvious was so painfully obvious in Britain. And I'm afraid Richard Hasty. Uh, President of the Council of Foreign Relations, is absolutely right in his most recent book on this when he says, America's role in the world will be determined at home. It will be determined by its economic health. And this is what really, really worries me. Let me just say this. I still have faith. I have faith in America's capacity to regenerate itself. I do. There's been many people who have bet against America for the past 250 years, and they've been wrong, I'm glad to say. Very wrong, I'm glad to say. But this time, we're at about the 11th hour, I'm afraid, and it's about time somebody got cracking quickly to tackle these issues, because I really, really worry them. Because I think we, the British and Americans, have a special relationship, but a part of it is that we speak candidly and frankly to each other, as only a friend speaks to another friend. And I will try to give you tonight a frank assessment of the degree to which some of the sinews of American power have already weakened and weakened very, very seriously. And what I want to do is to structure it around five lessons, five points, five lessons, from the decline and fall of British power, and say to you, please, please don't make the same mistakes. Although, sadly, America is already beginning to make some of them. The collapse of global British power was caused by the ca catastrophic financial and economic costs 
of two world wars, but particularly of World War I. It was also caused by the failure of the British economy to generate enough wealth to sustain its position as a global hegemonic power. And the collapse of British power, and this should really worry you, the collapse of British power was not caused by any failure in its political system. The British political system remained operating very, very smoothly, although certainly its political leaders made some bad choices from time to time, certainly. But the foundations of American global power, in my judgment, are already being eroded by serious economic weakness, compounded by an increasingly paralyzed and dysfunctional political system. Yeah. Do you know many states, by the way, and I study American government politics, I teach it, do many American states are now hopelessly gerrymandered? You know what a gerrymander is? Yeah, fixed. There's at least a, somewhere between 10 and a dozen are fixed for one party or, or, or the other. If you want to be scrupulously nonpartisan, as I always am, as the World Affairs Council always is, um, try Illinois for the Democrats, try North Carolina for the Republicans. It's disgraceful. Is it any wonder we've got such paralysis? No. What I want to try to do is to plead with you tonight, don't make the same mistakes Britain did. Because your role in the world is far, far, far too important. If the United States goes down, there is nobody else. There is nobody else. OK, let's start. Come back in time with me. Come back in time with me to the Britain of the 18th century. Lesson number one from the British experience. Never, ever, ever underfund your science and technology and engineering base the way Britain did. Never neglect your engineering base, your science base, the way Britain did. Britain, as you probably know, became a hegemonic power because it was the very first to industrialize. And Britain's industrial revolution was based on some pretty simple stuff. I mean, today it looks almost laughable, but it's true. It was based on very simple stuff, very simple technological innovations that didn't require any education or skill in engineering, technology, anything like that. No. Industries like cotton textiles, wow. Iron, coal, and steam engines, yeah, steam engines. And Britain was also incredibly lucky. It had colossal amounts of coal, colossal amounts of iron ore, no problem. Simple innovations, for example, mechanized the spinning of cotton thread from the little weavers' cottages into industrial weaving mills, first with water power and then with steam power, combined with the use of coal to smelt iron ore, James Watt's invention of the separate condenser, and lo and behold, super, we're off to the races, right? You've got the steam engine, right? And steam power, because Watt's great achievement was to transform steam power into a versatile source of power for everything from railway or railroad locomotives to steamships, right? There we go. There's the story. So consequently, by the middle of the 19th century, by 1851, Britain has its great Crystal Palace exhibition, right? Britain can showcase itself as the workshop of the world. Wow, terrific. In just about 70 years, Britain had grown to become the global hegemonic power. And based on this economic power, Britain was the global hegemon from roughly about, one could say, and from that time that the Duke of Wellington dealt a decisive blow to that other little jumped-up corporal named Napoleon at 1815. From 1815, one could argue certainly to World War I, and one could argue certainly even up to World War II, Britain was still a hegemonic power. So far, so good, right? So far, so good. Champagne all round. Rule Britannia. I shall lead a brief chorus of Rule Britannia. Super. Except there's a big problem. The big problem is that the British government never, ever, ever saw any need to invest in its science and engineering base until it was way, way, way too late. And to some degree, this was understandable. Henry Bessemer, the inventor of Bessemer's converter, he was knighted for it afterwards, good. He discovered the Bessemer converter basically by sheer bloody luck. It's true. Cold wind blows in, purifies the, the molten iron he's working on, lo and behold, bingo. Bob's your uncle. We're done. Super. 
But because Britain never invested in its science and engineering base, it lagged by the outbreak of World War I, way behind the United States and Germany, in not in the sunset industries, but in the new sunrise industries. Who was ahead in the sunrise industries of the, 21st, of the 20th century? The United States and Germany. Industries like electronics. It was the US and Germany, it wasn't Britain. Now mind you, Britain was still doing great guns in textiles <laughs> and coal and those, all this traditional stuff, right? The lesson here, by the way, is this. It's not what Britain did. It's what Britain failed to do. That's the lesson. It's what Britain failed to do. Now, let's take a look at the American experience on this. The US experience, until quite recently, has, I think, been on the complete opposite, was dead right, was spot on. The US was investing, spending wisely on science and technology. But you know something? Do you know where the real agent of innovation was? Don't tell me about free markets. Uh uh. It was, shh, don't tell anybody. I'll get run out of town. The government. It was the federal government. If you doubt me, here's the examples. All right. And we've got some people from the Air Force Academy who will cheer at the appropriate moment, right? All right. Where did the internet come from? And by the way, not from Al Gore, sorry. Not from Al Gore. Who really invented the internet? DARPA, exactly right. DARPA, who invented the GPS? Air Force. Air Force, absolutely. <laughs> Air Force. Who funded, we all, by the way, we all use Google, right? And isn't Google wonderful? And it is. Fine, great. But who funded the algorithm that has made Google's search engine possible? The government did. The federal government did. The National Science Foundation did. As a recent study by a University of Sussex professor has shown, and I quote, 75% of the new molecular entities approved by the FDA between 1993 and 2004 trace their research back to lab research that was done by the government, the National Institute of Health, who do the most world-beating basic scientific research. They're wonderful, okay? Now, later, she adds in her book, and I quote, all the technologies which made and make the iPhone smart, and many of you own or have a family member who owns an iPhone, all, all of us do, right? All of us do, right? Some kind of smartphone. But all the technologies which make the iPhone smart are also, shh, don't tell anybody, government funded again. Yeah. The internet, right? What's an iPhone without the internet, right? Wireless networks. Government funded. GPS, Air Force again, right? Air Force, yay, absolutely. Microelectronics, touchscreen technology. Now, give Apple great credit where it's due. They assembled it all quite brilliantly. But the basic ingredients is like having a cook. If you haven't got the ingredients to make the stew, you can't make the stew, can you? So, what worries me, so, so far so good. God bless America. Let's pass her on the champagne again. Great stuff. Ah, until we hit about the last 15 years or so, the US government used to fund basic research. And it has to, in fairness to the private sector, because you can't expect private sector companies to do this because so much basic research, you never know when it's going to pay off. It costs a lot of money. And the results, of course, are uncertain. You never know what's going to work and what doesn't. And the time horizons are so far ahead. The problem is the US today faces a threefold challenge in funding its science and engineering base, which is so crucial. First, the budget's getting crowded out. It's getting crowded out by the cost of entitlement programs, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and of course, interest on the national debt. As we gather here this evening, over 60% of the entire US federal budget goes out the door on automatic payments. This is totally unsustainable. Interest on the national debt, by the way, if the debt keeps growing by 2020, interest on the national debt will be bigger than the cost of the, of the defense budget. That can't go on. Secondly, and I've never understood this, 
is Congresses, and indeed it must be said successive presidents, both Republican and Democrat, an obsession with cutting discretionary spending. It's nuts. It leads to silly situations like sequestration. And you know how crazy that is. Who thought that one up? Well, we know. It was Jack Liu, actually, the head of OMB under President Obama, now Treasury Secretary. Thanks, Jack. Really helpful. Really helpful. And lastly, if you'll forgive my being blunt, the other problem comes from the Tea Party. The know-nothing Neanderthals of the Tea Party. And I'll repeat it. The know-nothing Neanderthals of the Tea Party. Who'd love to see government you know, cut back to the level it was in 1850? They love the post office, though, I suppose, or maybe not. Or in Grover, War Grover Norquist's words, you know, let's shrink the government so that it can drown itself in a bathtub. Okay. If that's what you want, fine. But if you do that, you're going right. This great country that I love so much is going to go down the bloody drain. And I don't want to see that happen because we need the United States far too much. Government funding is vital for its basic science and engineering base. That funding in real terms is going down. That funding is being crowded out by entitlement and interest on the national debt. And then you've got these yahoos who are going around saying, cut government back to the level it was in 1850. Well, that's OK, but you didn't have any iPhones. You didn't have any space program. You didn't have any science and engineering back in the 1850s. Yeah. OK. Now, lesson number two, industrial espionage. Let's not allow our industrial secrets to be stolen the way Britain allowed its industrial secrets to be stolen. In the middle of the 1850s, the British engineer, we're going to come back to him again, our old friend, Henry Bessemer. The British engineer, Sir Henry Bessemer, invented the Bessemer converter, the way to purify iron and make steel in record time. And it was an amazing accomplishment. It really was. It was amazing. Prior to Sir Henry's invention, it took months to make a ton of steel at a huge cost. Afterwards, it took a mere 12 minutes to make a ton of steel. Great stuff, one of the great inventions. Without Henry Bessemer, without Sir Henry Bessemer, no skyscrapers, right? No 20th century, essentially. What a brilliant British invention, you may well say. How right you would be. And Henry, good old Henry Bessemer deserved his knighthood. And how right you would be. So, okay, if the British invented this process to make steel so in such a wonderful way, how come that the biggest steel manufacturer in the world was the United States by 1914. Yeah? How come? Well, there's a chap called <coughs> Andrew Carnegie, an expatriate Scotsman. <laughs> the answer is the British companies, particularly in the center of England, were obligingly stupid in that they allowed their handful, and it was a handful, of scientists and metallurgists to give their scientific papers openly, sharing all their innovations with everybody. Good old uh, Andrew Carnegie, being a good canny Scotsman, sent his people to these conferences so he didn't have to do any R&D. No. So he did it the old-fashioned way. He stole it. Now, that's okay. It was only going to the United States after all, you know, friendly, ally country, etc. Not a, not a big, not a big problem, okay? No need to invest in science and technology, okay? Let the British do, do uh, the R&D and we'll capitalize on it, okay? All right. That was done by one major individual company, right? In a pivotal industry, to be sure. Did the United States government back this? No, it didn't. No, it didn't. But what's happening today? The 21st century equivalent of this is Chinese cyber hacking of US industry. This is now clear and incontrovertible. And it's clear and incontrovertible evidence from both the administration, Congress, and independent research institutes on this. There, is, there can be no doubt about this. China is doing to US industry what Carnegie did to British steel companies in the late 19th century. The difference is that today's theft is government organized theft. No question about that, it is. It's government-funded theft, government-organized theft, and it has huge national security implications. It does. Earlier this year, the Commission on the Theft of American Intellectual Property, headed by Dennis Blair, the former Director of National Intelligence, and John Huntsman, the former Governor Utah and former U.S. Ambassador to, to uh, China, concluded that Chinese hacking is costing the U.S. economy 
$300 billion a year. $300 billion a year. The White House agencies agree, stating the cyber espionage, and I quote, places the security of the US economy in jeopardy. Close quote. It certainly does. And worse, Chinese cyber espionage have secured, and again, this is beyond reasonable doubt, the basic designs of a number of our key weapon systems. The advanced Patriot missile, Pac-3, basic designs are now in Chinese hands. The Army's terminal high altitude area defense, FAD, now in their hands. The Navy's Aegis ballistic missile system, now in their hands. The basic designs for the F-18 uh, uh, fighter jet, now in their hands. The V-22 Osprey, now in their hands. The Black Hawk helicopter, now in their hands. And even more worrisome, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, now, now in their hands. But you know what's worse still? Is the sclerotic bureaucracy of the Pentagon, the sclerotic bureaucracy of the Pentagon in getting things done. Because in 2005, in 2005, the Defense Science Board warned Pentagon leaders against buying microchips from China for risk that there would be spyware worked into those chips. And there was. It took until 2011, six years later, for the Pentagon's sclerotic bureaucracy to finally stop buying Chinese microchips. It's the British story all over again. The US cannot afford this level of sclerotic bureaucracy. And by the way, if I may say so, every extra million dollars spent on cyber command is money jolly well spent. Tea party or no tea party. OK. Lesson number three. This really worries me as well. Please, for God's sake, America, don't make the same mistake that Britain made in failing to keep focused on the quality of its workforce, right? The intellectual and educational quality. It's all about, as my old boss, Tony Blair, used to always say, education, education, education. It certainly is. And the British example is telling. Well into World War I, and by the way, the British Army found out how lamentably educated British teenagers were, unless you came from the sort of British elite, as I'm fortunate enough to, to, to actually do. You went to a private school, you got a great education, you went to Oxford, Cambridge, whatever, fine. But the vast majority of British kids didn't, didn't even have a government-funded elementary education until well into the 19th century. Up until World War II, for example, there was no government-funded secondary education. Yeah. In 1944, two very important things happened in education policy, one in the UK and one in the US, right? In the UK, the Butler Education Act of 1944, part of Churchill's government, gave free education for all children up to the age of 17. You know, long overdue. And the reason that drove it was that in an increasingly technological war, which World War II was, the British Army, Navy, and Air Force found out how lamentably poorly educated the overwhelming majority of British teenagers were. And this had a huge spillover effect on British military technology. My cousin served and was a career officer in the Royal Navy, retired as a vice admiral. And I remember vividly when I was a little boy telling him, he was telling me about how the initial submarine detection system, ASDIC, which the Royal Navy used, just didn't work. The technology, the engineering just wasn't very good. It took a long time to get it right. Bombing. Royal Air Force. Air Force. Bombing. Right? British Royal Air Force was full of the most incredibly brave, brave young men. Incredibly brave because they knew their chances of surviving 25 missions over, over, over Germany, even at night, was frankly limited, to put it mildly. Very few of them, about one in a hundred, got through. Okay? But for all their bravery and all their courage, the aircraft were not well enough designed, not until about 1943, 44, and they couldn't hit a barn door at 50 feet. They were dropping bombs into the countryside, for God's sake. It wasn't until the American Norden bomb site became available that things started to change. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, so to speak, in 1944 in the United States, what's America doing? That wonderful, far-sighted stroke of genius by Franklin Delano Roosevelt called the GI Bill. And the GI Bill was not guaranteeing free government education up to age 17, right? The GI Bill, pardon me, was guaranteeing to pay for higher education, right? 
There's your big difference. Now, is it any wonder that the United States had the most productive economy in the world for the next 30 to 40 years? Of course not. All those brave souls who came back from World War II went on the GI Bill, and the United States had the most highly educated workforce in the world. Fantastic, great stuff. The US economic boom takes off and leaves the rest of the world in the dust, right? Amazing, great stuff. Now, you see the problem. The US had the best educated workforce in the world up until the 1980s. Now consider where we are today. Oh, dearie me. Oh, dearie me. In the latest OECD, the Organization for Economic, Co Economic Cooperation and Development, the Paris-based OECD, they do a study every so often. Their latest study shows that 15-year-old Americans rank 23rd in the world for mathematics. 23rd for mathematics. This from the great country that put the first man on the moon, that kindled my love affair with America, putting a man on the moon. Fantastic, great stuff. 25th in the world in science. Now, one can debate the merits of these various tests, and one is certainly open to that. By the way, British students fared even worse. But don't get me wrong, because the best American students are as good as anybody. If you take a state like my neighboring state um, in Massachusetts, just to my immediate uh, north, the students in Massachusetts are performing extremely well. They're as good as any eighth graders in the world. Thank you very much. If you go to affluent suburban areas in the United States, the schools, public schools, doing fine. They're producing young people as good as anybody. The overall averages are being brought down because instead of trying to continue what was begun in the 1960s to elevate poor areas, to actually break down racial divides, those racial divides have actually gotten worse since the beginning of the 1990s. That's the problem. So the overall trend is what we should be worried about, although there's plenty of examples of how it can be done right, and plenty of good examples, good American examples of how it's being done, of how it's being done right. What really concerns me, as uh, someone who teaches not only at West Point, you know that other place, chaps from the Air Force Academy, you know that funny people. I mean, instead of doing something sensible, you know, something really sensible, you know, like getting in a plane and flying there, they, we sort of march there. I mean, I, I don't I Never figured that one out. Never worked that one out. But seriously, um, there was a time when teaching in America's public schools was about creative thinking, right? Yeah? Now it's all about Teach to, to the test. And teaching as I do, in a public university as I do, I see the consequences of it every day. In the State University of New York system, one in every three students that comes into our university system requires remedial education. Mathematics, writing, we're killing ourselves because it's all teach to the test. And they graduate coming onto our campus, and oh, they get horrified because like, Foster, like Sky, I actually makes people read real books, write real essays, do real thinking, right? Yeah. They're not used to, oh, oh my God, you mean you've got to read a real book? Oh, oh, Professor Raymond, what are you doing this for? Oh, we'll never do They get there in the end, don't worry. I help them along, I get them there in the end. But still, it's really worrisome. And that brings me to the state of higher education, which worries me as well. Despite all those Tom Friedmanite language, that, so don't worry about it, you know, America's got eight out of 10 of the best universities in the world, and it does. And depending on your number, you know, 80% of the world's top 20 universities are all American, which is probably true as well. Hey, we're doing great. Don't worry about it. Everything's fine. You know, everything's all honky-dory. Well, I'm here to tell you it's not. It's far from honky-dory at all. If you look, the more deeply you look at American higher education, the worse it becomes. Sure, American private institutions, Harvard, Yale, etc., they're still wonderful. They're great. They may not have maybe six billion in the endowment, they maybe only have about five and a half billion now in the, in the endowment, that's fine. But 64% of American students don't go to private colleges or universities. They go to public universities. And those public universities have had their budgets cut to pieces. University of Illinois, University of Illinois. Do you know what happened? The faculty had to take a vote there to take a 7% pay cut to avoid faculty layoffs. I was, the, I was the Abraham Lincoln a visiting lecturer at the University of Maine, and I wondered why everybody was so gloomy. I found out very, very, very quickly. 
one third of the entire faculty was being laid off. That's where American public higher education is. That's the reality. And look at this. The US used to be number one in the world in college completion as late as 1990 when George H.W. Bush was the president. US used to be number one in college completion. It's now number nine. Nine. Canada, by the way, um, is number one. 25 years ago, the US had the largest number of college graduates in the world. Now it only ranks number five. Number five, and sliding. Amongst America's competitors, the number of young people aged 18 to 34 with an associate's degree has soared over the past 15 years, whereas the US numbers remained relatively stagnant. According to the Center on Work, Education and Workforce, by 2018, the United States will need 22 million new college grads, right? 22 million new college grads, if current trends continue. I stress, if current trends continue, where's the US going to be? Three million short, about three million short. And in my judgment, one of the main reasons for this is the, if you'll pardon my saying so, absurd way in which American higher education is funded. The US persists in linking opportunity with an astronomical level of debt. The average student now graduates with $28,000 in debt. Students who go on to elite colleges, who go to professional degrees, can graduate with a mortgage-sized debt of about $100,000 to $120,000. Now, Demos, which is a center-left think tank, has calculated that if you look at this, the damage to the United States economy over the next 20 years is going to be about $3 trillion because they're not going to be able to purchase enough. They won't have enough opportunity, they won't have the resources to begin accumulating capital assets. Dreadful. We're absolutely killing ourselves. And America's competitors just keep on going, full steam. China's building more universities than you can shake a stick at. Oh dear. And this ridiculous way of funding higher education is absolutely killing the country's long-term competitiveness. And I'm afraid it gets worse. Because we think, oh well, we send our students, we send our children off to college, and we hope they're going to be thought critical thinking and so forth, right? Social Science Research Council of last year showed, their study showed over a multi-year period, 35%, just over a third of students in public, and wait for it, and private colleges, are not improving their critical thinking skills. About a third of them are not improving their critical thinking skills. Their critical reading skills, their writing skills. Why? I think there are a number of reasons, but one of them has to be, there are many reasons, lack of ambition, ambition born of affluence, as we were discussing with your, with your students uh, this morning. But one of the key reasons is also the faculty. The faculty whose promotion and tenure is governed by publish or perish, right? Which leads to the production of a large amount of virtually unintelligible second-rate work for the most part, is not demanding enough serious reading, enough serious writing, and not providing rigorous feedback. On my SUNY campus, I provide 14 office hours a week, and I have my students in one by one, in a nice friendly way, and we go back and we'll rework their analytical work together to show them how it can be done. That's what we need to do, is to work on this level of depth. Because the fact of the matter is, that American students are not being well served and their parents are not being well served by the cost, the absurd cost of American higher education. Go to any private college and look at the luxurious campus, you know? Looks like you're arriving in Disney World. And many of these colleges have facilities that make Disney World look like the Mojave Desert. I mean, it's just absurd. When I went up to university, it was to learn and to study. I didn't want, you know, artificial climbing walls or anything else. Thanks very much. You know? Or luxurious Olympic-sized swimming pools and all the rest of it. I went there to learn. I went there to read and to think and have my mind expanded. It's long time, I think, we stopped. And the federal government needs to start clamping down on colleges, saying enough is enough is enough. The cost of a higher education is going up at an inflation rate of 6% a year. That's totally unjustifiable. Second last lesson. And this time I'm going to sound a bit like a Republican. Sorry, Sky. Don't smother small and medium-sized businesses like Britain did in unnecessary red tape. 
In the decades after World War II, Britain smothered small and medium-sized businesses in red tape. By the end of the 1970s, it was incredibly difficult to actually start a business in Britain. It was insanely stupid, just crazy policy. And indeed, not surprisingly, business formation, new business formation in Britain reached an all-time record low as unemployment reached an all-time record high. Britain in the 1970s went over a million unemployed for the first time. Awful, about a 12 to 13 percent unemployment rate. And economic decline accelerated. The economic workshop of the world had become the sick man of Europe. In his latest book, Neil Ferguson, who's, who's, the, who's a provocateur I greatly admire, in his latest book, The Great Degeneration, Neil Ferguson cites World Bank data to show that the United States is actually, hang on to your seats, the sixth worst place in the world to start a business, to get a construction permit, register a property, pay taxes, get an export or an import license, and enforce a contract. You know, all the basic things that you need to get a small business started. As Neil Ferguson now shows, it takes on his calculations 400 and 33 days to complete the seven tasks listed above to get a business up and running. That's about what it was in Britain in the 1970s. And Ferguson attributes this inordinate length of time to excessively complicated federal laws, I'm sure he's right, a lack of American tort uh, reform, and a sclerotic federal government bureaucracy. I think he's probably right. Is it any wonder that America's overall competitiveness has been declining as measured by the World Economic Forum? The US as late as, the, as really about the middle part of this first decade of the 21st century was still number one. It's now, as of 2013, number seven and sliding. Lastly, let's leave all the dismal signs of, economic alone, of economics alone and just let me last touch upon a conventional military point. Conventional thinking gets you nowhere. Conventional thinking ends up, in wartime, costing you lives. And it leaves you unprepared for the next war. I'm now going to take you back to the Welt in South Africa, February 1900. Okay? What's going on in South Africa in 1900? The Boer War, exactly. Britain, as the hegemonic power, defending its position, or really, if you will, trying to, defending its control of the global capital of diamond production, against the Dutch Boers, descendant of Dutch settlers. Let me just give you one example of this. Have you ever wondered why, in World War I, the British Army, the leadership of the British Army, believed that the decisive blow in the trench warfare of World War I would be delivered by? Nay. Clue. Nay. Horse cavalry, that's the idea. Mounted cavalry. You know, pennants flying, swords wielding, great stuff. Wonderful stuff. And that's wonderful for Buckingham Palace, it's changing the guard date. It's wonderful, marvelous, but it doesn't win wars. The reason was that two senior British commanders in World War I, Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig and General, Major General Sir John French, had made their military reputation by successfully relieving the town of Kimberley, the diamond capital of the world, still is, by the way, the diamond capital of the world, during the Boer War, middle of February, 1900. Background, very briefly. After a series of humiliating defeats, Britain was desperately looking for a victory and desperately looking for some heroes, right? And in Kimberley, awaiting rescue was Cecil Rhodes, yes, father of the Rhodes Scholarships and so on, the diamond magnate. 50,000 civilians and about 600 British troops. They were surrounded, right, by the Boers. Now, to Haig and French's credit, they spotted that there was one big gap in this surrounding area around Kimberley. There was a gap. How are they going to fill it? How are they going to get in there and rescue Kimberley, rescue Cecil Rhodes, diamond production, etc., etc.? They were going to do it with, here's the clue, nay, <laughs> nay. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. You got it exactly right. There were two ridges, but there was a three-quarters of a mile gap between the two of them, right? Okay. So, with 3,100 British cavalrymen, that's, if you want to do the math on that, that's uh, 12,400 hooves. And those hooves, we're going to come back to that in a second. Those hooves are very important. We're going to come back to that in a second. 
they charge magnificently between the two ridges, right? Charge magnificently. They are get the job done, rescue Kimberley, victory turn around. Britain goes from that point on, wins, wins the Boer War, and French and Haig's reputation is made, right? Great victory for cavalry, right? Yeah. Hmm. Now, remember those, remember those 12,400 hooves, right? Do you remember those? Well, they created a hell of a lot of dust, a huge amount of dust. The Boers were on defending on those ridges were blinded by the amount of dust. I mean, just imagine 12,400 ho 12, horses' hooves. The dust. Boers couldn't see a thing. And they fired too high. Of the 3,100 British cavalrymen who charged into that gap that day, only 12 were killed or wounded. An incredibly low casualty rate. Great stuff. Champagne all around. Except, <laughs> except, except, except that nobody in the British Army did a critical after-action analysis, which would have showed two rather important things. One, of course, the fact that if anybody had actually bothered to interrogate the Dutch Boer prisoners, they would have found out that they were blinded by the dust and they were firing over they didn't know where to aim at. The other thing was the Dutch Boers defending those ridges had no Maxim guns, the first machine guns. They had no machine guns. And strangely, for a country where barbed wire was in plenty of, plenty of uh, supply, the Boers had neglected to string barbed wire across that three-quarters of a mile stretch. If that barbed wire had been there, if Maxim guns had been there and just fired into the, into the dust cloud, it would have been a horrifying massacre. It wouldn't have been a great victory. But from then until well into World War I, Instead of thinking about innovative ways to actually penetrate those horrible German trench defenses of World War I with tanks and other innovative ways um, of doing it, they believed to their dying day, they believed that cavalry had done the day and the way forward was cavalry. Now, we can all chuckle about this today, but it led to the loss of, of hundreds of thousands of British lives, including my grandfather amongst them because nobody bothered to think through. Nobody bothered to think ahead. That was the real problem. Let me conclude by just saying this, because I've spoken for far too long, and I hope you'll forgive me, because I don't want to emulate the uh, long-winded British politician of whom Winston Churchill once said, and I quote, he has exhausted time, encroached upon eternity. So I'm not going to do that. But let me just say this much. The liberal world order we have today, for all its imperfections, God knows there are many of them, it depends on American global power. But American global power depends on economic health at home. If I'm right, and the US is in the initial stage of absolute decline, urgent action is needed. Urgent, because the hour is late. Otherwise, there'll be no global guardian, and the world will be in a very, very dangerous state indeed. Thank you all very much. I really wish you would speak your mind. <laughs> uh, but we've got a good amount of time and some good questions. Yes, ma'am? Um, Excellent question. Excellent question. Which, which I'll repeat for the ca so that the uh, library district will have it. Uh, the question is, is, given the issues and challenges, I'm paraphrase, given the challenges of education, is the point that we should say spend more time making sure that it's universally accessible, including low income, or is it about the quality of education of those who are receiving it now? Where would the priority be? Is that a fair statement? Um, it's got to be about both. Because when the United States was globally competitive um, in this area, and if you go back to the 1960s, it was a time when federal funding, federal support was about lifting up, lifting up these poorer areas, was about addressing racial and other inequalities that were out there. Now, one can, I don't want to, this is a World Affairs Council, I don't want us to, want to get into a huge debate about, about education policy, although that would be fascinating. But it was about both. The US was able to do both, and it was only, and basically, those standards between, if you will, those disadvantaged areas and the rest were actually closing 
they were significantly closing until we then decided, well, it doesn't really matter anymore. And it's interesting, I think, Condi Rice, in her speech to the Republican National Convention last year, uh, last year made a very good point when she said, it's totally wrong that the quality of your child's um, education is determined by their zip code. I mean, I live in a very prosperous area in eastern Dutchess County, which is about two counties to the north of New York City, and, you know, our zip code produces some very good public schools, mind you, at very high levels of taxes, but it's worth it. Um, you just go outside our zip code and you go into a town called Poughkeepsie, oh my God, oh my God, it's dreadful. And it's, you know, it's overwhelming in minorities, it's overwhelming, and they're not getting the opportunities that they need, they're not getting the quality teachers that they need. So it's both, really, it's both. I should I just want to point out, by the way, as, as some, some of you know, I mean, a conversation about education and the economy is, in fact, spot on in terms of what we do in the World Affairs Council. Good. If you go on the, the National World Affairs Councils of America website, you'll find, as some of you know, that over the last three years, we've done a survey among councils around the country that one of the most pressing national security issues facing the United States. And the number one and number two over the last three years have been a competitiveness in the economy and competitiveness in education going back and forth. Exactly so right. even though it sounds like a domestic subject, it's it is very much a global subject. And I think Terry. I'll, and if I may just add yeah, very, very briefly sure. to that, as you and I both made the point to your cadets in your classes um, uh, this morning, Air Force Academy graduates need to be concerned about this because the young men and women that you're going to be commanding that you're going to be commanding are coming out of this, and you want them to be as well educated as they possibly can be. Yeah. Terry. I agree, absolutely. Yeah. The, the question is, uh, it was a sidebar of a comment about Russia and Mr. Putin, who likes to put small business owners in prison rather than promote them. Uh, but the question is, with respect to the United States, where we don't put them in prison, um, what are the kinds of issues that we need to be doing to promote small business? Is that right? I think, you know, there are unfortunately people who will label this a Republican or a Democratic issue. This is not. This is an American issue. And if you look at the numbers on this, and the World Bank does this annual survey on this, and they crunch these numbers very, very carefully, I think Neil Ferguson's analyzed them very, very carefully. Uh, as late as about 2007, it was only taking 366 days to complete those seven essential tasks in getting a small to medium-sized business up and running. It's now 433. That's absurd. It's just patently absurd. And I think there needs to be a top-to-bottom regulatory review by the federal government eliminating needless burdens on small and medium-sized businesses because they are the engines of economic growth. It's not the big corporations. It's the small and medium-sized businesses. Top-to-bottom regulatory review to get rid of these needless burdens. Why should it take a decent, ordinary, hardworking man or woman 433 days to complete seven essential tasks? It's not that they're lazy, they're not. They're working as hard as, as, hard as be damned. But it's the regulatory burden. And it's also, I think, also the complexity of federal law. I mean, if you look, for example, at Dodd-Frank, now Dodd-Frank, God knows, was needed. But there are so many studies that have to be maintained. I can tell you at this point, I have friends on Wall Street who say, well, you know, okay, we know we did wrong, we're going to comply, but it would be helpful to know what we're actually going to comply with. Because years after Dodd-Frank, they still do not know exactly what the regulations are. And it just we have gotten to an, uh, to an obsession with complexity. What we need to do as a great believer, I'm a great believer in KIS, keep it simple. Keep it simple and relieve these ridiculous regulatory burdens on small and medium-sized business. This is not a Republican issue. It's not a Democratic issue. It is an American issue. Ambassador Stu Symington. Uh, how has Britain, uh, abbreviated, but how has Britain ad addressed these issues uh, under Tony Blair, the current administration, dealing with these challenges as well? Right. Thank you, Ambassador, for a terrific question. I actually worked for Blair on uh, higher education, further education issues. And what we set out to do was, first of all, excuse me, and these have worked very well, has been to tackle the inequality issue uh, in our schools, the excellent point that you raised earlier. We created city academies that have raised the academic performance of youngsters in inner city schools dramatically. Would that we would have done it 100 years ago, but it's been done now, happily. Um, we also worked, for example, on 
further education was something that I, I, I led on for him. Uh, we learned a lot from American two-year two -year colleges. We learned how to structure relationships between the business community and those colleges. Uh, we actually put it in together, put the legislation into place and got it done in 2005. So I'm, that's something I was very, very directly involved in and I'm proud of. Um, we may or may not have gotten this one wrong, but on higher education, we did take the considered view, and I'm one of those who was, hope nobody was watching this in Britain, but <laughs> I'm one of those responsible for, oh dear, I'm done for, I'm toast. Um, I did recommend, and uh, my dear friend Andrew Adonis, now Lord Adonis agreed, that we should in fact get British students to pay a little bit of their college education because they were going to college for free. No, I think they should. I mean, I have a son who's in college at the moment, and I think that he should have, to use your American vernacular, a little skin in the game. And we did. We put in a small amount of money. So, for example, the average British student now, um, the average British student now pays about $5,000 a year towards the cost of their education. It might be too much, I'm not sure. But you're all laughing, and of course you're absolutely right. It's, it, is, it, is, it is a ridiculous. Speaking as a parent who's paying full freight for my own son to go through college, I share your, I share your view. So we, we tackle that issue because the view that certainly the Tony took was that we had to be focused on educating our workforce. It was, I, think, if, I think he would have agreed with virtually everything I said, I said tonight, certainly about the UK, um, that we needed to focus on enhancing the quality of our workforce. It was the only way we could respond to the challenge um, of globalization. And I think we've made real headway on that in that, uh, in that uh, regard. Um, I'm very much afraid, and also we made dramatic improvements, for example, in early childhood um, education. Um, it's something, again, I worked on for him. Uh, we borrowed a lot from Head Start. We borrowed a lot of ideas from, from Head Start. Uh, we thought it was a good program. Uh, we set about the idea of providing children with a, basically a sort of an educational bank account, if you will, so they would have money to help finance their education as they, as they went along. I'm, sad, I'm very sorry to see that David Cameron's government has been dismantling a number of those um, initiatives that we took, which I think is dangerously misguided. Um, and... Um, on science and technology policy, I'm very glad, certainly the policies that Tony Blair put in place have been carried on by the Conservative government in terms of putting a lot of serious money behind science. Uh, the Chancellor, um, the, current cha the Treasury Secretary in Britain, despite having put Britain through the ringer of a, uh, what I can only call destructive austerity, has nonetheless ring-fenced funding for science and technology, and I'm glad that Britain now has actually a very good science and technology base, but would that it had it about 40 years ago. I'm just worried that it may be just too late, but I hope it's not, because uh, there's many, many new discoveries to be made in the sciences, and uh, Britain's now well-placed to do it. In fact, I might point out that the United States still, I'm very happy to say, remains number one in the world in terms of Nobel Prizes in the sciences, and Britain's now number two. And it just shows with a little bit of long-term thinking, and even just even this this bears this bears some I think this bears some brief comment. You may have seen last year in the London um, Olympic Games because the Olympics is not just a matter about training; it's about science as well. It's about science and the helping athletes to improve their performance in an honourable way, no drug taking, doping, or anything else. But there's lots of scientific work is now going into the training of athletes. I mean, Britain, yeah, Britain beat out Russia. I'm glad to say. U.S. came out number one, that's great. China came out number two, pretty much as expected, although I'm glad the U.S. was one, China was two. And Britain, I always felt Britain could do it, you know, with, long, with serious money, long-term thinking, long investment, and the harnessing of that new science base. Look at how well Britain did. Britain came third in the world. Pretty damn good going, I think. And it shows, I think, there is some cause for optimism there. So I think the policies that we put in place were good ones, uh, although some of them are being dismantled by the Cameron government to their, to their uh, eternal shame, but because they were working. But uh, I never like to see anything being dismantled for ideological reasons. I want to see them, any government program stopped because it doesn't work. That's good. But I think we have made real progress. Wow. <laughs> do, do a word on, let me see, uh, intellectual... Intellectual property oh, theft and cyber theft. Um, I'm sorry, what was there? And, and defense. And defense, and the connection, and the connection with defense. Yeah. And then we got a couple of questions from our cadets.
just a quick word on the British side of this, and these documents are now being made public, so, so I mean, it can be said. Um, I know British intelligence is extremely worried about Chinese cyber hacking. And in fact, one of the uh, many reasons why the NSA is pumping quite a bit of money into its British cousin, it's into its British uh, brother or sister or cousin, whichever you like to call it, uh, and it's large, serious money, is to combat Chinese cyber hacking. And uh, British intelligence, it's at one of its most serious worries that it's, that it's actually going on. Um, on defense, I, let me just say, I utterly and totally deplore the policies that are being pursued by the Obama um, administration, so apologies to the Democrats um, in this room on that. Um, but I think they're totally wrong-headed. Um, there were cuts put in place even before the stupid sequestration program has been put in place. The U.S. military is absolutely vital. Uh, the U.S. Navy is already dangerously short of ships. The Air Force does not have enough aircraft. And the Army is being downsized to, uh, to an absurd degree. Stop these defense cuts now. Pete. Excellent, excellent question, excellent Pete. Question. Yeah. Uh, Richard Haas's book, the name, the exact name of the book escapes me at the moment, but this focus is on turning, uh, f you know, taking our domestic priorities first and restoring America at home. But the excellent question is, how do you play the trade-offs? How do you balance that and the need to continue to defend America's interests abroad, obligations, moral and political, with respect to humanitarian intervention, and the list could go on? Right. How do you yeah. make that balance? Yeah, I think I agree with much of what Richard Haas says in his book, but not all of it. And I think we're both coming from the, same, from, the same, from the same place. There are certain core duties that cannot, under any circumstances, be abandoned. And they don't need to be. Now, forgive me being very naughty. I'm going to be really naughty. I'm going to raise the naughty word. Shh. Taxes. <laughs> now, come on, folks. I spoke about this a year ago, and most of you were honest enough to admit I was right that we look at personal in income taxes. You know, all we need to do is to get back to where we were under Ronald Reagan, for God's sake. You know that terrible socialist Ronald Reagan? We need, to, we need to look. Income taxes are absurdly low. They really are. And they've been going down. down. If you look at the data on this, it's absolutely clear. There's no denying this. It's been going trickle, trickle. It's, it's trickle down, all right. Down, 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 down. Now look. Americans have got to get away from this childish belief that you can have a, gov a dollar's sense, you, that you can have a dollar's worth of government services for 45 cents worth of taxes, because that's where we are right now. America has got, but this, is, this requires a president to go out and lead and to explain the importance of national security and why there are certain core tasks that cannot be abandoned. Now, as regards the Navy, and let me just take them if I may, um, the Navy has vital duties. One of the most important public goods that it provides around the world is maintaining global sea lanes. Nobody else is capable of doing it, only the US is. Now, Britain helps out as much as it can, and you know, now I think it's time that we got others involved as well to help out. But the Navy is short of ships to do the job, right? Do you know one of the dirty little secrets of the uh, USS Cole attack? Why, you know, it was obviously an appalling Al Qaeda terrorist attack and so forth, of course, but, you know, not too many people ask the question why was the USS Cole in Aden in the first place? Because the Navy didn't have enough refueling ships where it could have refueled completely safely at sea. Right? The Air Force has been downsized, and this, you know, again, the politics of this are very simple. Look, Defense takes up 50% of the discretionary budget, right? So it's a nice, big, convenient target. But in my view, it's a target that is very dangerous. Stop defense cuts now. Because what can be done with a marginal increase in taxes and sensible management of the defense budget, the US can perfectly maintain its military capability, but only if we stop sequestration now, reverse the Obama tax, reverse the Obama um, uh, defense cuts, and get back and keep the US military at the level that we need it to be. Now, that's not to say there are certain prudent cuts that can't be made. Um, <coughs> sorry, I'm going to get thrown out now. For sure, TRICARE, there's reform is going to be needed there. Um, Reenlistment bonuses, you know the story of the USS Abraham Lincoln, where the, um, there were reenlistment bonuses for everybody. Well, fine, I'm all in favor of a reenlistment bonus for, for the pilots, for the people who launched the, the, everybody with specialized skills, people who launched them off the end of the carrier, fine. And the, and the recovery, all that I'm all in favor of. 
But you really need a re-enlistment bonus for the guy who makes the coffee in the, in the officer's wardroom? No. Do you really need a re-enlistment bonus for the guy who does the law, or for the people who do, who do the laundry? No. You know, we've got to be much more selective about these things. But nonetheless, um, I think there's certain core, hard missions that cannot be abandoned, and, if, and this is where I think Richard Haas is wrong, that if you start abandoning those, God help us. And it's already, I mean, frankly, and, and, and if I may be frank, I'm a very vigorous critic of much of the Obama administration's foreign policy, the idea that you can pivot to Asia, fine, but you can't walk away from the Middle East. Lift away that artificial set of boundaries that were put in place at Versailles, and what do you get? And look at the real underlying picture. You've got Sunni versus Shia just pawing the ground for a colossal conflict in the, in the Middle East. I may be wrong, I'm one of those gloomy people who actually believe that the jihadist uh, genie is out of the bottle and that a horrific conflict is in place in uh, the Middle East. And, you know, I may, I, I may be wrong, I hope I am, but nonetheless, the point that you can just, the wider point, that you can just walk away from key national security commitments, and again, I'm sorry, I maybe don't share your view of the importance of some of these other points, but I think the core hard commitments cannot be abandoned. We're going to go to Steve, and then we're going to come down here and yeah. a couple questions, and then come back over here. Yeah. A brief answer on the moral degradation of American society. <laughs> it does. It does. And it translates into our popular culture. It translates into the coarsening of movies, the coarsening of television dialogue. It, you know, it, it's just American culture, and I've studied American culture. I've lived here off and on since the uh, 1980s. I find it shocking. The coarsening of American culture, the, the debasement of moral values that once underpinned America, short answer is it does and it's dangerous and we've got to somehow start fixing it. And one place that we can start fixing it is Hollywood. Why aren't students going into Excellent question. Why are students not going into science and engineering in the United States? It's not a question of capacity. It's not a question of market incentives because they all get jobs yeah. without interviews and they all get paid well, so why is it? Exactly. If you look at the numbers on graduate education, those classrooms are not empty because they're filled increasingly with Chinese, South Koreans, Indians, um, and et cetera. I think to well, some degree, home, yeah, graduate. exactly, instead of keeping them here, I'm exactly so. I think this goes back also to a cultural point, um, and I'll answer this anecdotally. Um, I am blessed with a wonderful little 14-year-old son, and he watches a lot of Disney stuff after he gets his homework done, and if you look, at those children's shows, or sort of late children, early teens, kids, 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 kids shows. There's no emphasis on real achievement. Engineering and science isn't cool. If you look at, I mean, one of his particular favorites happens to be Austin and Ali. Now, it's a totally harmless kids show. I think my son has a crush on the girl who plays Ali, but whatever. Um, what's their aim in life? What's their definition of, of, of their success? It's becoming pop stars. Right? If you look at almost any Disney show that you want, it's all about what's cool. What's cool is becoming a pop star, right? Now, what's wrong with that? There's only one show that emphasizes science and technology achievement, and I do like it. It's called Phineas and Ferb. They're going to do it all, and they do. They build, they build things. They build submarines. They build missiles. They build, all, they build all sorts of things. It begins at a very early age. Um, I think Disney should be hauled on the carpet and say, listen, Hey guys, put your imagination to work. Building something that emphasizes strong moral values, science and technology achievement. I remember I was chatting with somebody earlier today about the magic school bus, you know? Emphasizing science and technology. Also, we've got to make science and technology teaching really attractive in our schools. We've got to be able to, whether it's providing graduate fellowships, whether it's providing the funding that, that's needed, we've got to get the best of our young math and science uh, youngsters, if we can get them fired up, get them to teaching because there in turn they're going to fire up other youngsters to want to go into, to go on to go into the field. And, um, you know, we may well need another space program, another Obama failure, if I may say, say, uh, if I may say so. Look at the inspiration that the space program gave to science and engineering in the 1960s. It was cool. Don't you want to put a man on the moon? Don't you want to help to put a man on the moon? Yeah. That's 
cool, that's hot. What we need is someone to change the culture, improve the, improve the education, and fire people up with the idea that science and education, science is great, it's fun, and you can do wonderful things with it. And you're absolutely right. So many companies have so many en en engineering jobs available, and they can't fill them. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get these last couple of questions in. Yes, ma'am. I, I'm going to try and summarize that and essentially say, where is the, where, you know, where's the return on investment into yeah. education? The, the answer cannot simply be throwing more money at education. So how do, you, how do you square that circle briefly? Cut school and cut college administration. Quick anecdotal example. I, in my school district, I led a tax revolt against the school district superintendent who thought he was entitled, we're going back to the cultural point again, entitlement, culture of entitlement. He thought he was entitled and he was getting a quarter, sorry, $240,000 a year to supervise just a couple of schools, which were doing very well anyway. Um, he uh, hired numerous assistant school superintendents at about $125,000 a year who just got in the way. And so that's step number, oh, and by the way, he also had a, a taxpayer-funded car, despite the fact you only need to drive 10 miles, and had a tax-funded gas card. So let's stop the culture of entitlement among educational administrators, right? Now, let's get to the colleges. The college faculty are not being paid a lot, of, a lot more money. They are not. If you look at any of the private colleges where the tuition has been going up to um, absurd degrees, they've created all these needs, these imaginary needs programs, and you need the assistant to the assistant to the dean who's making $100,000 a year to help people climb, you know, climb walls and to have Disney-type experiences and so on. Get rid of a lot of them. Get rid of a lot of them. If you look at where the educational expense, why we're looking at inflation at six, a six an education, higher education inflation of 6% a year, it's in the bloody administrators. Does any college administrator, should any college administrator, any college president be getting paid millions of dollars a year? No. No. They don't deserve it. Most faculty in most public universities have not had a pay raise in years. Don't blame the faculty. Blame the administrators. The, the question was, what, you know, it, what, what's pushing that? And the answer is a lot of things. But go ahead. A lot of things. And a culture of entitlement that is at the very top of them. I mean, why should a school superintendent who has about five schools under him, all of very good schools, who don't need a lot of supervision, why does he feel entitled to a salary of $240,000 a year, plus a free car, plus free gas cards, and then start spreading, uh, spreading the wealth, if you will? Gas, oh, yeah, you're my new assistant superintendent, right? We'll give you a gas card as well. You know. It's a culture. It is, it is a culture of entitlement. It's a culture of entitlement. And it's just got to stop, because we cannot sustain higher education inflation at 6% a year, get rid of, cut, you could get rid of about at least half the administration of any major college and the performance would still not be affected in the slightest. But we've also got to get out of this culture and this is also one of the enemies is, is ourselves because the demand has been coming from parents. Why if you can go to small, even small colleges, there's one near me, I won't mention it, but a small college and it has the most luxurious grounds and facilities, you think you're walking on Disney, you know? And the tuitions and the tuition, the total cost has gone from, it's went up in the past few years, from about $13,000 to nearly $30,000 a year. Why? To pay for all these things, which they argue, the college presidents argue, well, you know, we have to do it because the parents won't send the children if they don't have these wonderful facilities. I looked at their townhouse facilities because my son was thinking at one point of going there. These are luxurious townhouses. I mean, you know, that you would, that you or I would not have seen when we were in college, you know, we wouldn't have seen them when they're in college, but it's all to pay for comfort, you know, Disney level facilities and so forth. And they argue, and I don't know if they're right or wrong, but they certainly argue the parents are demanding it. And that might go back to the cultural point about a culture of entitlement. I wonder what the founding fathers would say if they were here today. I think they'd be pretty shocked. We have run out of time. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me for, uh, in, th in thanking Ray for yet another quiet, unprovocative, Great.